see a few more people uh, jumping onto the call. But we're going to go ahead and get started. It's two after two. Um, today we're going to be uh, going through a presentation on reasons to upgrade a Sage 100 contractor. Again, my name is Andrew Rashid. I'm with Alliance Solutions Group. And our um, agenda today, we're going to go through a brief corporate overview just to give you a little bit of information about our firm and Sage uh, software. And then right from there, we're going to jump through a quick product demonstration, specifically covering reasons why we feel um, our clients uh, can justify upgrading to Sage 100. And then following that, we encourage you to reach out to us to learn a bit more about the product. Um, today, again, we're just going to be hitting just a few bullet points. So for a deeper dive or to get a little bit more info, just give us a call. We'll be happy to set up a one-on-one -on -one presentation uh, to your specific needs. So just a couple things about uh, Sage. They're, they're a publicly traded uh, company. They develop a number of different software solutions. Today we're going to be focusing on the Sage 100 uh, product. And one of the things that I think really indicate the strength of this company as it relates to the construction industry, which all of us on the phone this afternoon are a uh, participant in, is the fact that Sage is growing at a pace of two new construction clients every hour. So just take a step back and think about that for a moment, because what that basically is indicating that every person on the phone today, the odds are very high that someone that you are doing work with or work for is currently using one of our construction technology products to manage their projects and their business. Now, when we think about Alliance Solutions Group, I think the thing that we try to get across to all of our customers is we're really a consulting group. And our entire focus is on the construction and real estate space. So unlike other uh, companies out there where they may uh, work with different types of businesses, our entire, our entire firm's focus is entirely on developers, contractors, and specialty contractors. Our entire suite of products um, focus on those efforts, and we also really pride ourselves on being a local uh, organization. Um, if you look there at the map, all of the little green shaded areas is where we have coverage, and the blue dots are where we actually have our physical offices. Um, one of the other nice things that really help differentiate us from other firms is the fact that our client base is fairly large, currently at around 6,700 active clients. So um, if you kind of go back to the statistic I mentioned before about Sage, uh, locally speaking, um, those people are using Sage products the odds are we implemented them. So I think those are really good things for all of us to kind of take into account. Um, we're going to go ahead and jump into the product. Just a quick reminder, it is going to be a bit high level. So at the conclusion of this, um, please feel free to give us a call. Again, we'd be happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one presentation uh, for you and your team. So. Um, Reasons to upgrade to Sage 100. <clears throat> when we look at a lot of the clients that we typically bring into the fold, um, they typically have a number of things in common. Um, either they're on a generic package um, that really is not industry specific, which creates some issues for them. In other words, they have to do some of their workflow outside of a system. Or the other uh, item, is the fact that they're on, they may be on a construction specific package, but the technology that it sits on is antiquated. And so one of the first things I want to just mention, one of our first reasons, is the fact that Sage 100 is a fully integrated product specifically built for the construction industry. Um, and if you just quickly look over here to my system menu, and again, we're not going to hit all of these today. But as you quickly glance through those, 
you can quickly check off a number of things that uh, you or team members are currently doing outside of the system. And so one of the things that Sage 100 does a great job is managing your entire workflow in a single um, application. Uh, the other thing um, <clears throat> that we would also uh, keep in mind is the fact that although we're doing all of these uh, activities in a system, the user experience is an easy to use experience. Um, if you kind of see how it's pretty um, easy to navigate through the product, it's very intuitive. Um, so whether I like to kind of work through a system menu and go where I need to go, or you're more visual in how you navigate product, so instead you'd like to hide the menu and work through these tabs and process maps, which by the way are completely configurable, um, you can elect to navigate through the product this way. So I think when Sage rewrote this application, they did a really great job keeping the end user in mind and keeping it easy to use. Now, when we talk about the next reason, which is better cost controls, which I kind of think of being, you know, having strong budgets, tracking committed costs, managing change events, and then pulling that all over into reporting. Let's kind of go through an example workflow of that. Um, you know, we could technically start from estimating and, and choose to have that data flow over into the budgets. But for today's example, we're, we're going to just start post-award. In other words, we've got a new job and we need to create a budget for it. And so when we say that the system is built with a contractor in mind, um, what we mean by that is it just starts with creating your budget for the job. Uh, when, we, when we look at how the cost codes are laid out, you know, we understand that these cost codes should be grouped by division. That being said, we also understand that we are going to work with many different types of contractors, whether they're an electrical contractor, plumbing, a home builder, or a GC. We want to be able to accomplish their business requirements. And of course, it starts with developing a cost code structure that makes sense to the customer. So although we're looking at one that's kind of built off of the 16 divisions, just keep in mind that you totally have the freedom to tailor this cost code and division structure to meet your specific business needs. And once we have that in place, we simply pick and choose the appropriate cost codes to place on this job to create our budget. And we can break that budget out, not just by cost code, but also by type of cost. And that's going to let us get another layer of reporting, if we wish. And really, this is the first step in starting your project or, or setting in place your cost controls. Now, before I leave here, a lot of people tend to ask, what type of security controls do we have? Well, they're actually fairly robust. Uh, an example of that is we can actually choose to lock this budget down and actually control who has the rights to unlock this budget and make a change to it. Otherwise, the only other way that someone could change the budget is by doing a change order, which of course produces an audit trail. So again, once we've got this budget in place, the next step of the process is to do what we call the buyout. Now when we think of a buyout, we're really talking about committed costs. And so when we think about committed costs, we think of two different things, either a purchase order or a subcontract. So because we do have some trade contractors on the phone, we are going to touch on purchase orders. And when we think of purchase orders, one thing that comes to mind is, can we actually allocate a PO against a job? And the answer is yes, of course you can. And when we also allocate this PO to that job, one of the really nice things about going back to my first statement, which is we're fully integrated. A great example of that is if I was sitting here entering a new PO for this roofing job, and I wanted to know what other POs 
um, I had for either yard birds or did I cut any other POs for this specific job? Either one of those questions could come up. I could drill down from the purchase order. In other words, without leaving my work, we fully support dual monitors. So what I mean by that, I could just drag this over to another monitor and actually pull up a log of all the open POs that exist uh, to this vendor, including what job they're allocated to, with the ability to drill into those. So quickly accessing information with just a couple mouse clicks. Same thing goes if I was curious about all the POs specific to this job. Same thing goes. Drill into the job. Drill into your purchase order log. So point being is, regardless of where I'm at in the software, there's plenty of opportunities to navigate while you're doing your data entry to get any type of supporting information. Now when we do the PO, <clears throat> another thing that we typically get asked is if we're not using estimating, can we still create a list of items that we frequently order so I don't have to hand key them in every time? The answer is yes, you can do that. So I can quickly navigate to my parts database and just quickly pick the items that are applicable to this PO and indicate the quantity that I'm going to order. Another really nice feature in the system is the ability to efficiently get this, this document out to my vendor. So, you know, if I was to go ahead and um, print this PO, here's what it would look like. And with our form design tool, you can put the logo that you wish here and add any legal language um, that you would like. But the point is, if I wanted to get that out to someone very quickly, um, we have an integration with Outlook. And what I mean by that is, I could just click this Outlook button. It's going to convert that document that quick to a PDF, attach it to my outbound email, where I can very efficiently get this purchase order out, in this case, to Ashley Brandle. Now, another thing we can do is if Ashley happened to reply back to that email with a signed purchase order, just indicating that she's accepting that PO and will provide and furnish those materials, I could drag and drop that email right onto this particular record. And now that email becomes a permanent part of my record or my system of record. The other thing that we want to make sure we kind of indicate is POs fully integrate with a number of different places. We already talked about the job and the vendor, but also with accounts payable as well as inventory. So when we enter an AP invoice against this PO, we're basically drawing down against that quantity that we've ordered. And as those invoices get entered, it will update this to date uh, column here. And so now let's talk a little bit about the cost controls. So once we try to save this purchase order and go to the next step in the process, we can actually set the system up to be intelligent enough to monitor my budget at the time of save. So what I mean by that is I'm getting ready to commit this PO uh, to the job by way of sending it to Yardbirds. Well, before I save this, I might want to make sure that this PO does not exceed my budget. And so the system can be um, established to do that. And you can actually determine how you want the system to react to a situation if this PO at the time of save is going to exceed my budget. And you can have it be a soft warning or a hard stop. And you can even put in place tolerance. So we can now quickly determine how the system is going to react to and when a PO going over budget. Also, when we um, are thinking about tying this PO to AP, when this to date column fully equals what we've ordered, we don't have to manually come in here and close out the PO. We could have the system do it for us. So 
when we kind of go back to point one, fully integrated with contractors in mind. I mean, we just hit a slew of things just talking about POs. We talk about uh, integration. We also met, showed a few examples of that. Let's talk about subcontracts. Now, when we talk about subcontracts, slightly different because now we're not as concerned with unit price. We're more worried about a schedule of values. So the first thing is when we talk about vendor controls, different than cost controls, talk about managing this vendor perfection windows. First thing we can do is track certificates of insurance and actually being uh, proactively warned if someone has an expired certificate of insurance. So that's always helpful. The other thing we can do is assign this uh, subcontract to a job and like I showed in the PO screen, quickly and easily um, produce logs for subcontracts, um, either at the job level or at the vendor level. For you commercial GECs on the phone, it's also nice to know we can properly manage retainage. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, when we enter an invoice, well, one, it's going to auto-calculate that retainage for us. It's going to withhold it from the invoice for us. And if I needed to produce an aging report, whether it was a receivable aging report for the job, or in this particular example, a payable aging report for the sub, it's going to uh, show us an aging report with retainage in its own column as it should be. In other words, we're not going to float retainage along the aging until we release it or an, from a receivable perspective if our client releases it, then it will float. So from here we just put in our schedule of values and here's where we can start highlighting some integration points. First off, um, we uh, as we record change orders, which I'm going to go to next, so we'll talk about that in a minute, but as we mark those change orders as being approved, it's going to update the schedule of values uh, for the sub, giving us a new contract amount. As invoices get recorded by the accounting department, we're going to benefit from that data entry and it's going to update uh, in this column what's been entered in AP, which quickly and easily identifies our remaining contract by line item. So from a project manager's perspective, yeah, this is where I could go and, and, and enter a new contract. And yes, I could go pull a report to tell me the same things. But it's really nice that if I'm a, P, a PM, I could quickly pull up the job, drill into this contract, and really get all of the information I need. So I can see a summary, or if I want to see what's being held in retainage, click here. I can see the retainage amount. I can also get a change order log uh, for the subcontractor just with a mouse click. And while I was here, if I had decided to see the detail on why there's a back charge, I don't need to leave my work and go find the change. Again, just drill down. Drill down into it. I can quickly see the reason who's doing the corrective work. Um, because like I mentioned uh, earlier when we talked about POs, we do attachments, document imaging. So um, if there was any backup to substantiate this back charge, I could pull this up, take a look at it, close out, end up right back where I started. Or maybe I wanted to get an invoice log related specific to the sub. Again, you could drill down and actually pull up a copy of the invoice. So, you know, the, from an integration perspective, it's a really good uh, demonstration of all the different things that we quickly tie to. Just doing the very same work that you currently do today, just in a more efficient manner. Now, let's talk a little bit about the next step in the process, which is change management. Changes happen and, and, and they definitely impact the budget, the contract, and our committed costs. 
And so Sage has done a really great job building a method to manage your change events in a single data entry screen, keeping it easy to use for your, your team and your staff. Just come in here, pick the job, put the change order number down. If there's, a, if there's an impact on, on time due to this change, we could indicate that. It will print it on the change order, and I will show you an example of that in a minute. But here is kind of the controlling factor of what is the difference between a change request and a change order. You see, open, review, and dispute, that's a change request. So therefore, that's not going to update our contract or our budget. Yet when we mark this approved, it will then update our contract. And to give you a visual example of that, I'm just going to drill into the job real quick. And while I'm in the job screen, I'm going to pull up the contract summary. And while we're here, I'll just show you, we've got our original contract, approved changes to date giving us our new contract. So change requests stay open. They don't impact our contract. Yet we still have visibility on those. When we talk about the integration, we have these two different tabs here. This is the prime. This is your uh, homeowner, client, GC, um, whoever you're contracting with. What we're doing and what we're going to charge. Over here, this is the impact of that uh, change order to the budget. And actually, this is something I really like about this part of the product. If we um, understand that this change is going to impact perfection windows, and I indicate that. In other words, I pull in perfection windows from our easy-to-use drop-down list. The system actually is smart enough that it knows that, hey, perfection windows on the record residence is subcontract number 33-89. And so it offers that to me automatically. I don't have to find it. I don't have to remember what it is. It just provides it to me. And then if I wish, I can then allocate the change order to the appropriate schedule of value line item on their contract or leave it blank and it will append it at the bottom of their schedule of values. Your choice. We'll track their change order number. And like the uh, prime change order status, we will do the same with our subs. So we can track their uh, change orders as well. The change order out of the box looks really nice. Looks like this. And again, we can uh, put our logo up there. There's that time delay. So we can produce professional documentation out of the system. We can efficiently tie this through all the different layers that it impacts, and we're off with our day. Now, those are just some examples of tools in the system that help with the cost controls. And typically, those things I just mentioned, um, when we bring a client on board, they really see value there because they tend to be doing those things, either in a very uh, uh, manual way um, or just literally uh, in Excel. And we can get them out of those methods and bring them into a more systematic approach. And so now we've got an understanding of, of those elements. Let's go to our next item, which is better reporting. You know, we want to ultimately make decisions with confidence. So. If we know that we're putting appropriate cost controls in place, and look, let's face it, this is an accounting system. So AP and, and payroll is fully going to burden in the job costs. So if we're, if we're blending those two things together, what kind of reporting can we get out of here that makes us feel comfortable with our numbers? Well, the first one is one we call the job summary report. Now, there are over 1,000 reports in our system. So when you reach out to your territory manager to get a deeper dive in this, um, they'll be happy to show you some additional reports. But for today's conversation, I've got three that I want to mention. Um, this particular one, because quite frankly, it's the most common one, you, commonly used one in construction, and um, it's called a job summary report. And this one's great because 
It breaks out your original budget, changes to date that are approved, your new budget, your cost, your percent of complete, and your variance. I get all of it in one report, subtotal by division, with drill down. So I have the ability to actually drill down into the detail, which is great. One other thing I want to mention before I leave this report. So our system is real time. Um, someone just asked a question um, in the chat window if um, we are a batch posting system. The answer is no, we are not. Real time. Again, we want to make decisions quickly with confidence. And how we can do that is when that button hits saved, job cost is immediately updated with that real time data. Great question. All right. Let's talk about another report. This one's a different flavor, kind of what I just showed there. It's a committed cost report. And I, and I like this one, and it really kind of, the topic is very uh, pertinent because we're, we just talked about contracts and purchase orders. So when we, when we look at a committed cost report, um, what this particular report does for us is, again, it gives us our budget. Uh, in this case, it combines original and, and actual. It gives us the, the real-time budget for the job. It shows us our cost of date, and it shows us our remaining commitments. Now, we do produce this report in a few different flavors. So, um, you know, again, if this isn't exactly uh, what you're hoping to see, um, don't fret. We can produce this in uh, a different layout for you. But um, this is just a really simple way to look at your committed costs. Again, it's got drilled down. So if I need to see the detail behind this, in other words, who are these commitments uh, laid out to? I could, if I want to see it split out between POs and subcontracts, I could. But the power of this particular one, and the reason why I'm showing this report, is it's a great report to look at at the beginning of your project because I can quickly see if we are um, producing any buyout savings or not. That's the first thing. But the other thing is, at the tail end of the job. So if I go pull a job cost summary report and we're just killing it, we're doing great. That's what we're thinking anyway. Job's complete, we're under budget, and we're celebrating. Well, not so fast because uh, for all the folks on the call that are down here in Florida, we all know sometimes our vendors will bill us a little late, whether it's a supply house or a sub. And so where this report can be valuable from a job closeout perspective is before I do my happy dance about my, um, how great I did on my project, I might want to pull up this committed cost report and take a look at it. Because if I see that there are any costs in this column here, I can quickly uh, be notified that, hey, look, we probably have not been billed for that item yet. That's why it's still committed. So um, this becomes a valuable report, not just uh, at the beginning of your job, but actually during your closeout as well. All right. Now, the last report I was going to show is um, what we call a bonding report, or otherwise known as a work in process, or a WIP report. And so um, we can get this. And if you think about kind of the elements that we've talked about, uh, thus far, it kind of makes sense as to why we could produce this report because um, all the things that go into this um, are already being done from a data entry perspective in the system. So clearly, we could produce this pretty quickly and efficiently. And um, again, you know, like the other examples, I could drill down, you know, all the way into the transaction because everything's so tightly integrated all the way down to the invoice. Close out. So that's really great. One of the other things I didn't mention a few minutes ago about our reports is we've got some other functionality that's, that's really nice. Um, first off, if maybe your CPA wanted that report but they prefer to get it in a spreadsheet, 
no problem. Um, just one click integration to Excel, just click this button and it will um, actually drop that data, that report we were just looking at into a spreadsheet like so, fully formatted, even with the formulas, which is huge. So this is you know a real living, breathing spreadsheet. Also, I talked about the Outlook integration, so if I wanted to just email the report, I could. But how about this? Maybe um, that report I just showed you, you would like to receive on a frequency. Well, like, for example, um, I'd like to go ahead and have this report emailed to me or to a group of people every week at Monday at 7.30 a.m. Well, as you can see, it's totally possible to do that. So you can set it and forget it. It's done. At, from that point moving forward, it'll auto-distribute uh, that report based on that distribution list and frequency that you had indicated. Okay. Now, the last item that I want to talk about as it relates to Sage 100 is key performance indicators. So how do we take all of this stuff that we're talking about and present it in a way to executives and management so that they can make quick business decisions? Well, one of the tools that we have, and we have a couple, but one of them is called the executive dashboard. Now, this executive dashboard is a very easy to configure solution to put forth a lot of key performance items front and center to your management team. So to uh, tailor it to your personal likings, you just come up here, add remove content, and basically pick and choose the content that's relevant to you that you wish to see. Now, once that's there, it's very easy to refresh the data that's being presented to you. I can quickly, you know, scroll through. I can even reorder these if they're if I prefer to have them in a different order, no problem. And like our reports, everything has full drill down. So really nice way to navigate through your information from an executive perspective. So if there's one thing that I would leave you with today, it's, it's that. So um, let's end our, our call today with, with where we're going next. And, and, and this is where I think really differentiates us from really virtually everybody else out there, and that is Sage's um, initiatives to go mobile. So, you know, we're, we've talked about kind of our ERP, but um, I thought I'd just give you a sneak peek at some of our mobile initiatives we're doing. Um, you know, starting with um, service. You know, we've got a lot of contractors out there who are doing service uh, management. And as we all know, um, there's this new um, kind of, uh, it's in vogue to be mobile with iPads and, and things like that to do your, uh, your work orders. And with Sage Service Operations, um, not only does it give us a really nice clean interface to dispatch our technicians, even um, integrate those work orders to a map, but um, also allow us to handle these dispatches from a technician perspective on a, on a mobile device. So now, and it's fully integrated uh, with Sage 100, so now we have the ability to gain efficiency not just in the enterprise, you know, the company, but in the field. Another initiative that Sage is doing is taking the operations side of a project and making that mobile. And that's where we introduce Sage Project Center. So now we have the ability to go mobile where it matters, on the job site. So we can do things like meeting minutes, RFIs, daily logs, um, all that type of stuff. 
and, and I think where Sage got it right here is we can tailor the solution to meet the needs of the client. So what I mean by that is, for example, a trade contractor might go, hey, that looks kind of cool, but we don't really need to do that because we just use um, our contractor's collaborative system. Like, for example, if they use Contract Project Center. Well, no worries. This is a choice. We don't have to deploy this. Likewise, my GCs on the phone may not even understand what Service Dispatch even is. Well, same thing goes there. We don't need to add this element to your system. You can basically uh, choose that. So, um, to recap, um, I think the reasons to consider upgrading into a system like Sage 100, and hopefully we can you, you all come away with this understanding today, is we're giving you a fully integrated application that's easy to use, and it's built with your business in mind. And in doing that, because we were able to successfully achieve that, you're able to have better cost controls, things like managing your budgets and committed costs, change management, those become easier to do in a system, which ultimately leads to better reporting. And with some of the new initiatives that Sage is doing, we're not going to limit you just to the enterprise, meaning the office. We're now going to be able to allow you to go mobile with your uh, business. So again, um, I want to thank everybody for their time today. If anyone does have any questions, I'll left the phone number up on the screen. Um, 